Hello, and thank you for joining us for what I hope will be an interesting and informative discussion around some of the latest data in rheumatology. My name is Professor Peter Nash from Griffith University in beautiful downtown Brisbane. And today I'm very fortunate and delighted to be joined by uh, Professor Laura Coates. And Laura works at the uh, Oxford Psoriatic Arthritis Centre, uh, the NIHR Clinical Scientist Senior Clinical Research Fellow there. And uh, she's done a number of very important studies in PSA. And we welcome you, Laura, and thank you for giving us your time today. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. So today, Laura and I are going to discuss a recent paper published in RMD Open, which is looking at quality of life, physical function, uh, and the impact of an R17 inhibitor secukinumab on these and its relation to structural damage in patients with PSA. So, Laura, can you just introduce yourself for the audience and maybe a little bit about um, your interests and what you're working on at the moment before we get stuck into the trial, into the paper. Sure, yeah, so I'm Laura Coates. Um, I'm a researcher and an honorary rheumatologist at the University of Oxford. Um, and my interest is very much around uh, clinical research in psoriatic arthritis, um, understanding how we use the drugs we already have, how to select the right drug for the right patient, um, and obviously, I've done a lot of work in the past around treat to target uh, and targets for treatment to try and ensure that we are getting people to the best state, not just feeling a little bit better, but actually getting to uh, good levels of disease control to uh, try and maximise their outcomes. Excellent. And this particular paper, let's um, set the scene a little bit. Could you tell the audience about the Future 5 study? Actually, what did they try to do? Yeah, so future, the, the future studies were a series of studies looking at the efficacy of secukinumab in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, and as it looks, there's quite a few of them. Um, future 5 is, is one of the largest ones. So it compared different doses of secukinumab, had just short of 1,000 patients included in the study, so a very large uh, phase 3 study. Uh, they looked at the 300 milligram dose of secukinumab, uh, the 150 milligram uh, with a loading dose, uh, the 150 milligram without a loading dose, uh, and then a placebo group for comparison. Um, so a large study, uh, very much in keeping with most of the phase three studies we see in uh, biologic treatments. So predominantly in polyarticular disease, patients who had quite a lot of active disease to start with, and were then randomized to one of those groups. Um, and that study followed people um, out to two years. So we've got good long-term long data uh, to look at different outcomes for the patients receiving those different treatments. So tell us a little bit about the importance of those patient reported outcome, physical function, quality of life um, at the human level of, of patients in this trial. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're trying to make people better um, and we typically look at outcomes like ACR outcomes, uh, we like to measure joint counts and know that people's swollen joint counts are going down. But at the end of the day, what we're all trying to do is make people feel better and get people back to a normal life. Um, and so the, the commonest used measures for that uh, are around what people can do. So um, disability or ability, um, how much you can do day to day tasks and live a normal life independently uh, and quality of life. And so here we looked at the hack di. Um, which is actually quite a low bar. It's quite an old measure. Um, so the sorts of questions it asks about are, can you lift a cup? Um, can you cut your dinner? Um, can you get things out of cupboards? So it, it's not particularly high level of functioning. It's very much basic day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, and then for quality of life here, they looked at the short form uh, 36 or SF36. Um, and both of those are commonly used in phase three trials. And they give us some idea of how the disease is impacting on the patient day to day. Excellent. Can you tell us what the primary outcome measures were in this trial and maybe explain them for those people who aren't quite familiar with depths of emission and et cetera? Yeah, so um, in this particular analysis, what we wanted to do was look at the different remission measures. Um, and so we looked at two key remission measures that are used in psoriatic arthritis. So 
DAPSA, the Disease Activity and PSA score, um, which is uh, a simple sum of your tender joint count, your swollen joint count, uh, the patient uh, VAS for global disease activity, the patient pain VAS and the CRP. Um, and so that gives you a score. Uh, and to be in remission, you have to score four or less. Uh, to be in low disease activity, you have to score uh, 13 or 14, depending on which version or less. So that's um, a very good measure of articular disease control. It's focused on the joint counts with a little bit of the patient reported outcome measures and then a CRP for a bit of kind of objective measure of disease activity. So that gives us an idea of how well the arthritis is under control. And then the other measure that was used was MDA, uh, minimal disease activity. Uh, and that one is a binary measure. So you're either in MDA or you're not. Um, but it looks at seven different items. So the same as the DAPSA, the two joint <laughs> counts, the global and the pain score. But then in addition, it also looks for disease control in the skin with a PASI or a body surface area, with enthesitis um, and with function. So the HAC score. Um, so that gives us a bit more of a global look of disease activity, including skin and emphases, as well as the joints. And in this particular study, you not only looked at remission, you looked at sustained remission. So can you just define those couple of groups? Yeah, so obviously, you know, it's useful to get people better, um, but we need to get people better and keep them better um, over a period of time. It's no good achieving um, remission once over like a two year period, for example, in this study, what we want to do is get people controlled and keep them controlled. It's really important that we look at sustained response and a sort of long term response, uh, especially from the patient point of view. Um, so here we looked at patients who never achieved low disease activity or remission, the patients who, who always had high disease, uh, patients who achieved it just once. So they, they maybe were down there briefly, but, but didn't manage to stay that way. Um, or patients who were sustained. And we um, defined that as patients who were in the low disease or remission state um, more than three times between weeks 24 and 104. So over that kind of six months to two year follow up period within the study. So they didn't always have to meet it. We know obviously some people will have flares or will have issues on and off, but it means that they were there for the majority of that time over the extension period of the study. And it's fair to say, uh, to come the efficacy of the therapy, that of the randomised patients, 80-odd uh, percent continued out to two years. Um, of the 20% who didn't, a small number, like 6%, had some AEs, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, even, even lack of efficacy was reported in under 2%. So in a way, that speaks nicely to the efficacy of the drug. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what your method, what the results were over that two year period, and 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 how, and maybe a little bit about the demographics of these patients because they had, you know, eight six eight years of disease. They weren't uh, fresh new patients. No, absolutely. I think they are kind of typical um, for the sorts of patients that get included in these studies. Um, but they are not necessarily completely reflective of our um, clinic population. So the majority of these patients were um, established disease, as you say, sort of six to eight years of disease before they'd come into the trial. Uh, most of them had been through other drugs before. Some of them were biologic experienced. Um, so between uh, a half and 20% uh, in the different groups um, had seen biologics before. Um, so they 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 have quite established disease, uh, and like most of these studies, they're very polyarticular patients. So uh, you know, fifteen to twenty tender joints, and sort of eight to twelve swollen joints. So quite a significant burden of disease for these patients coming in. These are are not mild or early patients. Um, a high proportion of them had enthesitis. So over half uh, had enthesitis and a third or more had dactylitis as well. So there's quite a lot of disease in different areas, different domains of psoriatic arthritis um, that's active for these patients coming through. I wonder if similar to the rheumatoid experience, 
given those details, there'll be an element of irreversible hack. Do you think that's that's a, a real thing in PSA patients? Yeah, definitely. So we've we've looked at the hack. Obviously, hack is very responsive in these studies. We do typically see a good benefit for drug versus placebo in the phase three trials. Um, but getting down to low levels is not always possible. Um, so we do see an element of irreversible hack related to X-ray damage, although the relationship is quite poor between those two things. Um, we also see that your hack goes up as you've had disease for longer and as you get older, because obviously other things are going to affect your functional ability, not just your psoriatic arthritis. And can you tell us a little bit about X-ray measures? Because it's fairly insensitive and we tend not to do X-rays much anymore in the clinic. We use ultrasound, MR, more sensitive measures if we need to know what's going on. So X-ray is kind of an FDA-driven um, thing required for labels and things. What, what's your feeling about um, the degree of progression in this group of long-standing disease and the measure itself? Yeah, so you're right. Obviously, uh, arthritis measures um, uh, and x-ray damage focus on the hands and the feet. Um, and I, th I think in this sort of population, that's probably reasonable. But in clinic, that's not always helpful. We've got patients who only have a knee and an ankle um, and their foot and hand x-rays are always going to be normal. It doesn't matter um, how bad their disease is. So it's only looking at the articular disease. It's looking very much at the small joints in the hands and the feet. Um, rather than the other joints, it's not picking up any impact usually from from enthesitis or uh, obviously from skin disease. So I don't think it often reflects what we really feel is going on in totality. But it does give us um, some level of clear structural damage measures. And as you say, there's there's better ways certainly of looking at inflammation. In my clinical practice, I would use ultrasound regularly, much more than X-ray. And that's much more helpful for, to, for me to make a decision. Um, but I think in these trials, there is still a role to look at the, the progression of disease and the damage that we see with the x-rays. It does tell us something about the disease, about the progression of disease um, in these patients who do have polyarticular kind of small joint involvement. But it is relatively insensitive. Obviously, here we've got a reasonable duration of follow-up. So that helps uh, having a, a long term follow up out to two years where we're seeing some change. But in all of the trials, that's driven by a small number of people. So most of the patients that we include in these studies are not rapidly progressive. They don't show big changes in their X-rays. But there's that small proportion who do have more rapidly progressive disease. And if we could do better at predicting those in clinic, I think that would be helpful to try and drive um, how we treat patients and how we monitor patients so that we get patients well controlled and maybe keep a closer eye on those who we know have a, a poorer prognosis. Exactly. We, we find we use ultrasound uh, in those tricky patients where it's a very inflammatory story, but there's nothing to find clinically and you're looking yeah. for some, some clinical sign of eyes. We use it in the ones we want to taper, who are doing very well, mm -hmm. because we know if there's some clinical sign of itis and we taper, they'll flare. And we have a number of, now that all our dermatologists are using the uh, the skin scores, ERP and whatever, they send a lot of OA patients who have psoriasis mm -hmm. and are very symptomatic. And they say, yeah. do they have OA and PSA or do they not? And it can be quite a tricky uh, patient population to separate. Um, your feelings on ultrasound in, clin in the clinic? Yeah, I think definitely the same. So we have ultrasound embedded in our early arthritis clinic, and that allows us to kind of prove or disprove. Um, there's definitely sometimes when I ask for a scan expecting to see something, <clears throat> there's sometimes where I ask for a scan expecting it not to show anything, and but but I can kind of put my mind at rest and put the patient's mind at rest. And as you say, those who have definite osteoarthritis and psoriasis, um, often patients who are overweight as well, really difficult to, to assess. And we don't want to miss the fact that they can have PSA and OA, um, and we or, or we want to make sure that they don't have anything inflammatory going on. So we find that really helpful in our early arthritis clinic. Uh, 
And then the other ones, like you say, within follow up, it is that question. Patients who've had disease for a long time, maybe also have osteoarthritis, um, who you're seeing at follow up, they feel that they're not responding to the drug or that they're losing response on a medication and they're concerned. Um, and often when we scan them, things uh, will either be fine and we can reassure them, treat for pain, treat for fibromyalgia, get them through our physio service, or we can think about changing treatment if that's appropriate. And there are always some cases where I'm surprised, um, which is why I still get the ultrasounds. Uh, there are always some patients that I, I think I'm going to be able to reassure and actually we pick, pick up active disease, typically in the feet or somewhere where we're not so good at examining them. Um, as well as the patients where I'm, I'm just kind of reassuring myself and them that the drugs are currently working. So, so tell us a little bit about the results. Yeah, so in this study, um, we looked, at, as you say, at the patient reported outcome measures and also at the x-ray measures, um, having split the patients into these three groups. So the patients who didn't respond at all in terms of low or min minimal disease activity, um, who responded just one period um, in the follow-up or those who had the sustained response. Um, so if, and unsurprisingly, um, the patients who are um, getting sustained response um, do much better. Um, and that's true regardless of which measure you use. So it's a little bit easier to achieve measures uh, like the DAPSA remission. Um, and the DAPSA low disease activity compared to MDA uh, and very low disease activity. So if you're trying to achieve all seven of those uh, multi-domain outcome measures, it's only about 20% of the patients who get a sustained response through the trial. With minimal disease activity achieving five out of seven, um, it's getting up to more like half of the patients then um, doing better. Um, and if you're looking at DAPSA low disease activity, it's 70 to 80 percent of the patients um, who are getting that sustained response. So there's defi definitely different levels of disease control. And if you're looking at enthesitis and dactylitis, uh, as well as the joints, that, that's a little bit harder to achieve. But for all of these different outcome measures, you do better if you're in sustained response. Um, so for a hack. Uh, we only looked at the DAPSA measures because obviously HAC is in the minimal disease activity criteria. So of course you're going to have a lower HAC uh, if you're meeting the criteria that include it. Um, but with DAPSA, which doesn't include a HAC, uh, we still see that the patients getting a uh, good change uh, in HAC is much better in those who have a sustained response over the two year period. And then for quality of life for the SF36, again, the same story, um, whether you're in uh, very low or minimal disease activity or in DAPSA remission and DAPSA low disease activity. Um, so you can see that benefit uh, translating from a measure of disease activity to a measure of better quality of life. And for the clinician, the parameters associated with better outcomes, age and weight and things, what, what did you find? Yeah, so obviously we know um, that it's not just the arthritis um, that will have an impact uh, on the outcomes. Um, so there are other things that are going to affect the, the chance of achieving the outcome uh, and also then uh, be associated with the quality of life. Um, so perhaps unsurprisingly, patients who had a lower BMI um, and who hit reductions in, in tender joint counts and pain uh, are more likely to achieve those sustained outcomes um, and also younger patients. And maybe that is that uh, element of irreversible hack that you mentioned before. As patients are getting older, they can't necessarily hit that very low level of hack. Um, in terms of uh, pa patients who are less likely to achieve the outcome, if you had, again, higher disability scores, so again, um, that irreversibility potentially, but also enthesitis, um, so uh, pain at the entheses, uh, also means you're less likely to hit the low disease activity and remission criteria. And that's true both in MDA, which measures enthesitis, but also for DAPSA, um, which obviously has measures of pain in it uh, from the patient point of view. Excellent. And we're very fortunate we can use freely the 300 milligram dose. 
<coughs> many countries can't easily. Can you tell me if there's a dose difference? Yeah, so um, we're one of those countries where it, it is a little bit more difficult. <laughs> um, so we can occasionally, we can, we can get 300 milligram dose for the TNF failures, um, for sure, and for those with more significant skin disease, as per the label. Um, but we don't have um, as much freedom uh, to increase the dose uh, if patients have partially responded, for example. Um, but here, um, there wasn't a big difference uh, between the different doses. Um, so I think there's, I think what we're doing is reasonable, typically starting at the lower dose um, for those who don't have skin disease, have not yet had um, uh, biologic. Um, but I think having that ability for individuals to increase the dose uh, is uh, potentially of benefit. And would, is there any way of distinguishing Enthesitis driving the chain, the the outcomes, and synovitis driving the outcomes. Could you see any differential, or it wasn't examined in that particular way? Yes, yeah, so I think that's difficult, and I think it's difficult because enthesitis is so tricky. Um, so enthesitis here is measured by pain on pressure at an enthesis, and we know from uh, ultrasound studies and lots of other imaging studies that that doesn't necessarily correlate to a, to a clear inflammation. So I think it's hard to know here, enthesitis or presence of enthesitis was definitely a predictor of outcome, but whether that's inflammation in a different tissue that's maybe, you know, doesn't respond quite as well or is more, you know, resistant to treatment or whether that's a reflection of overall levels of pain, I think is hard to be clear. And the obesity issue really is rearing its head again. And now that there's this plethora of weight loss drugs coming and that small Egyptian study of metformin, I wonder if we'll start doing some trials with some of those medications as an adjunct rather than as a replacement and really focus on obesity and PSA. Yeah, I think it's something that we haven't focused enough on. Um, and I, I suspect partly from our side, that's also that getting access to those services is not, not always easy. Um, so you, uh, one of my patients specifically asked me um, about weight loss surgery. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we went through all of these criteria. Uh, and actually, he does meet quite a lot of the criteria. But I can't refer him directly. It has to come from his GP. He's got to go through various, you know, high tier weight loss dietitian clinics and, and medical clinics before he's potentially eligible for surgery. So the bar is quite high uh, and it's quite complicated and difficult to get people into those services. Um, obviously, there is a lot of excitement around the new medications. Um, they're showing results that are pretty comparable, really, to surgery, um, which is very impressive. Um, I guess there's a question about access and cost. And long-term outcome, is, is that then a drug that you need forever? Um, what happens if you have it for a period and then stop the medication? Um, and certainly in the UK at the moment, there are big issues with supply. So it's difficult even for our diabetic patients who are on these medications to get access. And so for patients who are not diabetic, that's much, much harder. Um, just, just literally supply and demand being a problem at the moment. I think it is an issue all over the world, but not only are we seeing injectable semaglutinide, there's now oral agents. So mm. I think things will change over time, particularly um, generics, such and et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So yep. A, take, a take home message, please, for the clinician from your study. Yeah, so I think not surprising results, but what we showed is that those patients who are achieving remission and are sustaining that over multiple visits in the study, um, regardless of the dose of secokinumab in this trial, um, they had better functional outcomes, so they're able to do more, they had better quality of life, uh, and they had a much better chance of showing non-progression on their x-ray, so of having that damage controlled over the longer period. So it's just better outcomes if we can achieve those disease activity measures. So I think it really argues for the idea of treat to target, the fact that we should be aiming for good outcomes, not just a 50% a improvement, but actually getting people uh, well, getting their disease under good control 
and keeping it there um, to give patients the best outcome. And it, it really speaks to the efficacy of the seven teams in doing all those things, this drug in particular. Safety hasn't really been looked at in this study, but any comments on, on safety in Future 5? Nothing unusual, no new no, signals? Nothing unusual, no. So I think it was kind of in keeping with what we'd expect from an IL-17. Obviously, there is yeah. the risk of fungal infections. Mostly they're not a big issue and they can, can, can be managed. Uh, I typically warn my patients so that they know that there is a risk and they know what to do if they do develop a fungal infection. But other than that, um, it looked very much in keeping with the other data. Yeah. And finally, do we forever keep measuring DAPSA and MDA or will the field ever come to some kind of consensus? Because now <laughs> there's so many trials measuring both. Yeah. Will there ever be a consensus on which one to use? So I think trials use both because trials like having lots of outcome measures and telling people as much information as they can out of the studies. And obviously both of these are composite measures. We're not going to stop measuring joint counts in clinical trials. We're not going to stop measuring hack or patient pain VAS. So we'll always be able to calculate these post hoc um, with the data that we have in the trials. Um, so that I don't think that will change for trials. There is a question about where the focus will be if uh, we have now got studies looking at minimal disease activity as a primary outcome. Um, and I think that's a really positive move to shift from measures like ACR20, which we borrowed from rheumatoid, and are not really the kind of level that we want to be aiming at, um, to having a, a good outcome uh, as the primary outcome. And I think that's important. In clinical practice, it's very different. We're not going to measure all the things that get measured in clinical trials. That's way too difficult to do. Um, I, I think you can argue for using both. But I think if you're using DAPSA, we should still be thinking about the other measures. We should still be thinking about enthesitis, about skin disease, uh, particularly skin disease, because that's hugely important in selecting a drug. If somebody's got very severe skin, that's going to drive us to some of the different biologics, maybe as opposed to a you know biosimilar TNF as our routine first line treatment. Um, so I think it is important to measure skin and some of the other domains as well. So we typically measure MDA in clinic because we'll get a quick idea of the skin. We only do a body surface area. We don't do a whole PASI uh, unless they're in a study. Um, but just having a rough body surface area of skin, the joint counts, a quick look at enthesitis just gives us a better idea of where the patient is and I think helps us pick a therapy better as well. And the new updated July guidelines is moving down that domain route. And the treatment algorithm is very much now driven by which muscular extra articular manifestations the patient has. So thank you very much for your time, Laura. I know you're busy, you have to go. If you'd like to know more about this paper and others uploaded to the CSF website this month, you get detailed slide sets for available in the publication section, cytokinesignaling.com. Please subscribe to this podcast on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your podcast media. And we'd love some feedback and let us know what you think. So thank you very much for your time, Laura. Thank you. All the best.